Go. Hi everyone, I'm Timothy Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and welcome to our weekly Wednesday follow-along live streams. I'm joined today by my lovely partner Josh, and we will be doing a conch study reference today. And this is kind of going along the mermaid type theme. We want to do a lot of aquatica nautica stuff. And if you want to follow along, the structure that we're going to do today is the one that we always do, which is 10 minute warm up, 90 minute on the actual subject matter, and then I'll do a mini critique afterwards. Now for the 10 minute warm ups, you can draw whatever you want. It could be something specific towards uh, mermaid. It could be, I'm going to be drawing shells for my warm ups, but um, you are free to use whatever you want for warm ups. It's just to get into the motion of drawing and get loosened up. And then during the 90 minute study, I placed a link to the conch, I believe, below in the description, or at least I should have. And you can download that. And we will be drawing that for 90 minutes, so an hour and a half. And it's gonna be focusing on texture and highlighting smooth areas. So last week with the fish, I made the mistake of drawing it way too big on my paper. It was like way too big. So I'm gonna draw my conch much smaller and that way I can really focus in on the details and talk about some of the, the difference in highlighting uh, materials that are smooth versus textures that are a bit rougher. And yeah, I think this will be a good study. I think this is a good material type study uh, for today. And if you have any other comments or questions during the live stream, just put at Vonner or at Schwa Plays Games and we will do our best to answer them. And that way it's easier for Josh to see it uh, as we're going through this. <laughs> right. I try to type in there sometimes too. <laughs> and the only really announcements I have is this Friday I will be inter interviewing Corey Godby and we'll be continuing my Von Art interview series. And he's an artist that I have met a few times. He is a fantastic fantasy artist. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met. And it would be great for you guys to see another journey uh, that is different than my own and probably your own and how he got there. Because now he works with big clients. He works with like uh, Dark Crystal. He does a lot of the Jim Henson um, books series with his work. And I know he's done a couple other things. I think he worked with, uh, I think he did the Labyrinth. Yes, he did the Labyrinth uh, book as well. So if you want to see his journey and where how he got to where he is, I'll be doing that this Friday. And then next week, Friday, I'll be doing the same type of interview, but with Miles Johnston. He is a, one of those pencil artists that I think is probably the most followed pencil artist on Instagram, I want to say. I'm throwing that out there. Don't fact check me on that, though, but I'm pretty sure he is. And I've, I've talked to him before. He has a really strange mind, and I love exploring his thoughts and theories about things. So that will be next Friday. And of course, next Wednesday, I'll have another follow along stream. It'll be something like this. And I think that's all I got. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I have a Kickstarter that is going on right now. If you want to uh, support it, it's for a card deck, and it is uh, about halfway done through the Kickstarter, and uh, I'm really excited. It, it did pretty well, so I'm, I'm very excited uh, to get these made and shipped out to you guys. Yay. So thank you, thank you, and yeah, I think we can go ahead and get going here. Take a breath, Tim. Okay, are you ready for yes. our 10 minutes? Um, yeah, I'll take the mouse over here, actually, and I can... Well, let me, because I got to then switch. Oh, yeah, yeah. like that. Okay, you guys ready? Ten minutes in ten. Oh, wait, everyone knows just random whatever you want for warm-up, right? Yes, yeah, I okay. mentioned that. Yeah, so whatever you want for warm-up. Okay, ready? And go. There we go. <laughs> so I will be drawing just some random seashells as we do this. Now remember for warm up, uh, don't focus too much on uh, detail, focus more on shape, focus more on getting your uh, fluidity lines grooving and moving. <laughs> Ross says hello from Amsterdam once again. Hello, welcome. Hello, back. hello. <laughs> Luna says, do you prefer to go by Josh or Schwa? Because I've seen both, but I just wanted to make <laughs> sure I wasn't saying the wrong thing. Um, schwa is what Tim started calling me. I think Tim's like the first person that's ever called me schwa. <laughs> and I feel like everyone's been calling me schwa now. I'm just a trendsetter. You are a trendsetter. You know? That's what so, I do. So I mean, I'm honestly okay with Josh or schwa. Um, I don't care. As long as it's not Joshua. So do not mix them together. <laughs> Joshua. Yeah, no. That's if I'm in trouble. 
I know. I remember when I started calling you Schwa, and then I heard. Uh, I remember. I think it was Tyler that said it, and I was like, "No, that's my nickname." I for think Josh. Tyler was like the first. Yeah, uh, the I was cat like, you stole know. that from me. Yeah, yeah no, the cat stole calls it. Me, I'm Schwa. Like fine. <laughs> I guess we can share the name. Uh, Zeal says, "Do you make the measurements of your drawing paper the same as the finished playing card?" Uh, kind of. So in I I do the iPad Procreate, or I use the iPad Procreate software to um, draw the cards in initially as like my thumbnails. And I have the card outline uh, already in Procreate established. So when I'm drawing, I kind of know where my guidelines are. But uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know this, whenever you print anything, especially when you're working with a company, you always have to have a bleed line. So you might think you know the dimensions of the card or whatever product you're working with but just remember any product that you make will probably have its own bleed line that you have to follow uh, the guidelines of whatever company you use so whatever you're working on if you kind of know what company you're going to be using i would go check out their website or go get some sort of a template so that you know how much larger you go because even when i'm doing my sketchbooks i always have to do 0.25 of an inch uh, all the way around on every single page as like the bleed area. So something to think about it whenever you're doing products uh, for your work. And I guess something I could mention really quick uh, while Josh is Oh yeah, sorry. checking things. <laughs> um, I was updating my list of everyone's names because Luna, oh. I have you down. It's so funny. I always say Luna, but I have your thing down already for Morgan, but I just say Luna all the time still. Oh, for I'm Luna sorry. Luz. Yeah. <laughs> but I added Luna now. It's just such a Morgan good username. Luna Luz just rolls off the tongue. Uh, but uh, yesterday, I signed up for the Criterion channel because Netflix and Hulu have kind of uh, been... I don't want to say exhausted, but we definitely watched a lot on it. And then Josh canceled the Hulu. So then I've just been watching a lot of, uh, what are those, the Amazon Prime original stuff. And then I was like, you know what? My friend Kyle mentioned Criterion Channel. And since I had to cancel movie, Mubi, I was really disappointed because I, I actually really liked Mubi. But uh, I made the plunge yesterday and got Criterion Collection Channel. And it is amazing it's like made for tim it <laughs> i mean <laughs> every weird movie that's existed is on there <laughs> as if my uh movie taste didn't need to be any more bloated and high pompous arrogant uh what would be another highbrow uh contentious like oh i feel gosh. like there's a lot of words i could describe my movie taste but this this service is for me. And if you're like uh, me, where you want to watch something that is different than the vast majority of blockbuster films nowadays, it is literally uh, the service you've been dreaming of. Now I did the annual payment, so it is a hundred bucks, but it's for the entire year. So it's technically less than $10 a month if you do it, the annual payment. And I'm telling you already, it seems very much worth it. And I've already discovered at least, I want to say like seven films that I've never heard of that I am going to love <laughs> because they're so weird. I, I've been telling Josh for a while now, I don't care if it's good or bad necessarily in terms of either the story or the um, the way it is shot. Sorry to it's, interrupt, we're at five minutes left. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Just give me something new. Give me something that is original and fresh and broadens what I thought was possible in the art form of film and media. So that is currently what I'm uh, really into. So I'll probably watch another one tonight. I watched The Juniper Tree with Bjork two nights ago. And then I found just a bunch of weird ones that I got to watch. I'll probably watch one of them tonight. Those... It wasn't claymation. It was the ones that were stop like... Stop motion. Stop motion. Yeah, so, those were good. If any of you guys... Or actually, like, I'm going to write it down. Them. So they're called the Quay Brothers with a Q. The Quay Brothers. They have a couple of their uh, short movies on YouTube that you can actually watch. But uh, they have all... The Criterion Channel has all of their films, at least from what I can tell. I don't know if there's even more on like hidden gems out there. But they have all of that. And I'm so excited because it's this really eerie stop motion that 
Imagine if Tim Burton was even more dark and had more of a German expressionism to his work and had less music, even though I love Danny Elfman, but less music and more a focus on like intricate nuances and movements of these puppets and the things that he does. So if you're into weird crap like I'm into in terms of film, I would definitely check these out. And definitely just Google the Quay Brothers for uh, just something to watch. They're like 15 to 20 minutes. And if you're really bored or if you're looking for something new and fresh, I would definitely recommend that. I mean, Tim's definitely changed my appreciation of movies. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm such a rom-com or just mostly comedy movie person if I just want to sit down and watch a movie. But I feel like I'm getting some interesting yeah. things in. Just movies that I have no idea what's going on. When I think a lot of the times, the, what oh, that one that we watched, the French one, there was a lot. The eighty three one, knife and heart. Yeah, knife and heart. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that was that was interesting. There are well, and oh my gosh, if you guys know David Lynch, he is a super weird movie director. And if if I were to recommend any, I would either do Blue Velvet or Eraserhead. You still need to watch Eraserhead. That is, I people consider it the first weird movie. Or like the first head. popular weird movie. This is like before Rocky Horror. This is um, something that I want to show Josh. But then I discovered he has this one movie that is on the Criterion channel. Oh, what's it called? It was something really bizarre. But it's like stop motion, but it's also nightmare fuel. I watched the trailer and I, I was I showed was Josh. That, I was oh, like, yeah, that I was when you showed me, right? Yeah, it has like the grudge girl singing the ABCs. That's right. You gotta look away. Oh, I think because I'm so conditioned by, I've seen so many horror movies because every October, well, now I've gotten you into this too, where that's all I watch. Yeah. I won't watch anything outside of horror during the whole month of October. And I feel like you're more of a movie or more of a horror buff than I am. But like last year we binged all of Nightmare on Elm Street. Those are pretty good. (laughs) Uh, Yes. And if any of you are into those, I would actually say the third one, Dream Warriors, was my favorite. Oh yeah, that one was the best. Which that and the the last one surprisingly was pretty good too, but it was new nightmare. That yes. was the one where they like that was meta. Meta, yeah. that's what <laughs> the word you used, yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of a commentary about the actors who play the characters, and then it's a movie about them actually experiencing Nightmare on Elm Street. So that was pretty interesting. And then we still have to watch the what was that the documentary about it? Oh, that's like the four hour documentary on it yes and then uh get this there's another one called it's like never sleep again but it's the main character in the second film the guy the gay one well we the, the unofficial no yeah. he is no he is oh he is but okay. it's like unofficially the gayest horror movie or that's like it's you know title one minute left by the way oh, oh. nicolina thank you so much oh well thank Got you for number. joining the emojis enjoy all these emojis Oh yeah, that's the thing I forgot to mention. If you guys want to become one of my YouTube uh, members, you get access to all of the emojis. And every time I pass 10K subscribers, so we had one, I think, last week, we do a giveaway stream where we hand out enamel pins. 30 seconds. We did find out it's a little tricky, though, because we have to kind of figure out how to message people uh, for the uh, enamel or the metal pins to actually ship them to you guys because YouTube doesn't have like a direct message feature. So Josh has to do like some investigating to figure out oh, I think your I names got, and addresses. I think I got most of them. I think the only one that we really have left was you reaching out to, because you wanted to reach out to Jinx. Yes. Yes. So something that you guys should know in the think. future is if we reach out to you randomly, it's because we're trying to get you a metal pin. Oh, oh perfect. And then yeah. there's one other two I have to reach out to. Okay. So I got my little warm ups done. And Ooh, I'm going to switch to. I know. So drawing things that are nautical, to me, honestly, this is, uh, I don't want to say familiar comfort zone, but definitely a familiar comfort zone. I like texture. I like irregularity. And things that are aquatic or nautical tend to have a wear and tear element to them. Oh, there's oh, the fly. There's a giant fly in this room that we tried yeah. to shoo out before, and it was not working. I don't know if it's because we, we don't see them all winter, but I feel like flies look bigger every summer. <laughs> I think no, they, this one's big. They, they increase in size every year. This guy is big. Actually, I'm going to open up a window so it gets a little cool. Or do you got it? I got it, yeah. So if you guys want to get your pencils and markers and pens or digital tablets ready, we're going to be doing the 90-minute 
a study of the conch. I will also pull it up here. Oh. Da, da, da. So this Just is the conch we're going to be drawing. Actually, do you want to bring that over to my side so that way this I can one? refresh for you as you, you're drawing it? Yes. Yeah. So this conch is not my photo. So I have put in the copyright claims below. Uh, that way you can see the original um, rights to it. But when I saw this picture online, this to me was perfect because it has really fun shapes. It has a good amount of um, like a textured uneven surface. And then if you notice, it has really good highlights. And it kind of is a good material study for uh, smooth versus rough areas. And this conch has both because where the spire is on the tip of the conch is more rough and textured and doesn't have much of a gloss and shine to it as much as the interior does. So I notice that sometimes this blinks and I don't know why. Um, it's because I have to leave the screen up. I was That was what I was figuring out last screen. Like if I don't, this has to be the active window because if oh, we don't, then it, won't then it blink. blinks. Yeah. Oh. Um, but do you mind just clicking like right there because it's probably going to shift it. Oh. It all fit. Perfect. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll give you guys just a little bit more before we go, go ahead and do this. So if you want to draw the conch with me today, uh, you have a little bit more time to do so. Oh, yeah. Feel free to, to throw your warm-up drawings on Discord. Oh, that's right. So if you do want to follow along, and if you want to even post your warm-up sketches, we have a Discord below, and it's a channel of growing. It's like a, a community of artists that want either critique or just want other people to talk to or uh, discuss things with and you can join it for free below and that's where I post all my secret Patreon drawings so everything that I draw I usually post in progress pictures of what I'm drawing to my Patreons which uh, have their secret discord channels but the follow along stream ones are free and you can post it because then after this study I'll be doing a mini critique session that uh, hopefully will help you guys and we can continue to learn and grow and get better together. Yay. Okay. The what? Oh, I was just read comments. I don't know if you're ready. Are we ready to? Uh, yes. I, okay. Before you do that though, because I kind of want to talk about how to get started with the conch and then I'll, I'll pass it to you. Okay. So you said click this. So then this shouldn't blink, right? Yeah, as long as that's the active window. Okay, everyone. I hope you are ready. I know I got my pencil ready. <laughs> and in three, Go. So the mistake I made last week when I did the fish, which is now an unlisted YouTube video because I was so embarrassed by it, don't judge me for it. <laughs> I'm going to draw my conch much smaller because I know how much time we have and I'm much better working on a smaller scale when it comes to detailing and stuff. Because if I do it too large, doing a lot of detail work can be very difficult for me with pencil because I tend to draw a little slower. Now, if you're like me and you're, you kind of hyper-focus on areas, I would work a bit smaller as well for this study. That way, when I do the critique, you can show me the best of what you're capable of doing in the 90 minutes that we have together. Now, I'm not going to do it the way that is the academic way of doing it. I'm not going to be doing gestures and all that stuff because last week, I was really frustrated with my fish and I, I realized that it's not the way that I, I draw and I was trying to do this um, method of drawing that you're supposed to do but it wasn't true to who I am as an artist so I'm gonna go back to the way that I normally draw which is not the way that I I don't think I should ever recommend which is just kind of going for it and then editing along the way so do as I say not as I do type concept so as I'm outlining this, I'll pass this back over to Josh to um, handle more of the comments. Oh yeah, and Just then catch up a little bit. And... Yeah, and then I'll probably once I do the a rough outline with it, I'm using a two H because it's lighter and I can erase it if any errors happen. And then I'll talk about how to add some texture and all that good stuff. All right, take it away. Oh, first off, Drea, thank you for stopping Drea set out. Bye, Drea. But Drea, your warm ups are so good. Drea took, oh, hang on, where's Drea's? Let's see. There's Drea's warm-ups. Oh, yeah. So I had to go quickly because I couldn't do this one, but still got time in to do these. See, Drea, I like yeah. that you used a lot of the um, Velarte style of shaping it out with lines and using the form, or the lines to create the form of the shape. Yeah. It's really cool. But we'll see you next time, Drea. See you, see you. <laughs>
Um, but let's see here. Eddie says, thanks for adding me on Discord or rather welcoming. I love it there. And I already got a huge boost in confidence and sense Aww. of belonging. Thank you all for it. Actually, no matter on Discord or off Discord. Oh, well, thank you. That's really nice to hear, actually. Oh, yeah. I was looking for my needy eraser, but look what I did. I put them... Oh, that's right. In a glass case, <laughs> along with my green crystals, so I can feel all witchy as I pull them out. Because I lose knee erasers at least one a day, I want to say, is about my schedule. I step on them sometimes, <laughs> even too. I got one stuck to the bottom of my shoe the other day. I was yeah, like, oh, was all right. whoops. So now I have a little jar that I keep them in. Oh, you know what? One was already out. <laughs> but now, that's how it is my way of not losing them. And it makes it so that they don't get dusty. Because sometimes their knee erasers can just become dusty. And it's not a good look. Ivana says, I forgot today was Wednesday. Time goes so fast when in quarantine. Tell me yeah. about it. The weeks do kind of fly by. I mean, it's weird to think my Kickstarter is already halfway over. That's wild. Isn't it? It's going to be, I know it's going to be June before we know it or, you know. <laughs> Fidgety Fox Light as usual. Hello from. The Mothman State again, guys. <laughs> hello, welcome, hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Eddie says, today I think I'll be more in lurking mode as I do my own project. Thanks for the stream. Absolutely. I mean, I don't expect people to have to draw what I'm drawing today. If sometimes you want background noise or just to over listen to a conversation happening, I just want to provide these uh, again because I used to do these every week for seven years. Uh, but I, I, I like the interactions that these... Uh, create and I sometimes really like the conversation that comes about so yeah as much as I think it would be cool if you drew what I'm drawing as like a study and we can grow together if you just want to have this on in the background just to listen to totally cool with that too I mean I hope we're engaging enough that you are like wanting to listen but yeah thank you I hope Unix says uh, this is so different from anything I draw I'm terrified and excited how it'll go Honestly, just run with that excitement because uh, there are so many fun shapes within this conch shell. And uh, the best thing about doing something that is organic is it doesn't have to be perfect in the final result. I mean, with a study like this, usually you want to do like a compare and contrast on how close you got to uh, how realistic it looked. But when you're doing your own stuff, and if you're doing a conch shell in your own drawing, no one's going to know the reference. So if you make part of the shell too big or if you extend maybe the spire a little longer that's your own creative uh intuition and it maybe if even if it was a mistake that's okay because that's the beauty of organics is it's so easily forgiven and then you can play with it because then you can make like this spire super super long and then you can explore the forms and make it something your own so yeah have fun with this conch this is to me a really fun uh, material study. Now really quick, I did a rough outline of the entire conch cell. Usually what I do before I start doing more of my detailing is I'll look at the conch and I'll just give some rough general shading to the areas. And when I do this, I'm looking at shadows specifically and I'm trying to place them in the scene I'm looking at the curves in the shiny part, so you can see how in the interior it has a bit of that shiny fold. So I'm gonna give a little hint to that. And then um, a lot of the edge on the right side here has a lot of these overlapping folds. So I'll hint to that as well. So I'm gonna go through the entire shell, give some of those uh, hints as to where I want the detail, and then I'll go ahead and start with more of the the fine tuning here. Oh okay, yeah, take it's it like away. It's like wavy on the edge there. That's weird. I know. Well, and uh, obviously, I'm sure you know this too. With things that are in the ocean or water, when it gets worn, actually, our friend and roommate Autumn, she introduced us to what is it? Glass, sea glass. Sea glass yeah. Where it's like broken, recycled bottles that were in the ocean just broke up to such small pieces that over time they become smooth pebbles of like a shiny color translucent rock. And the same can be said about a lot of the things that are found in the ocean is they get smoother over time because of the way that the water is working them and it's constantly like in a washing machine basically. <laughs> and that's why stones oftentimes have a very smooth surface. And the great thing about this conch is it has a mix of the more rougher organic calcified 
parts of the shell near the top here with the very smooth inner workings of the home of a creature, whatever it was, on the inside. So this to me is like the perfect type of material study. It's so pretty. I wish I would have done this last week instead of the fish because the fish, I think, is much more difficult uh, than something like this where this is a good, focused, isolated study. I think these are the ones I want to do more of for the Wednesday streams because I think these can teach you a lot more uh, than when drawing a fish because you want it to be perfect. Same like with doing, if I did just like a profile of a female, I think people would be too focused on how pretty it looks, unfortunately, rather than looking at how well did I capture the skin material and how well did I capture the lip texture, things like that. So I think having a kind of inanimate organic object like this is great. They remind me of <coughs> Super Mario Sunshine. I don't know why. Remember the little crunch really? people? Oh, yes. Yeah. And then do you remember that zone where it was the giant, it was like the one, you went underwater and you kind of <gasps> cleaned the thing's fit, yes. the, uh, teeth. Wait. That was my favorite. I don't know if I remember the cleaning the teeth, but I remember swimming under to get no, to an it, area. No, it was the world that was polluted. You went to the one area and it was polluted, so the whole goal was to go. I thought everywhere in the sunshine was polluted. This zone, though, the water was really messed up. You couldn't swim in the water for the first couple missions until you jumped in the waterfall and it pushed you into this little hole in the underwater area. And then you had to go fight mm -hmm. this fish that had dirty teeth. And you had to, like, like jetpack its teeth and clean its teeth for him. And then the water got clean again. I would yeah. actually argue that that, I think, is my favorite Mario game. Yeah, no, I know, like, I know people love Super Mario 64, but I think Super I Mario Sunshine second. was my favorite. Well, Super Mario 64 just felt good. Yeah. I, I know that probably sounds weird, but the jump mechanic felt good. Like when oh, you step yeah. on something, it like, I don't know, it just felt good. I think for nostalgic reasons, maybe people like 64 more, but I love Sunshine. Plus, that was the first like GameCube, because remember how the GameCubes used to come with that game? That's, no. how I, that's how I got my GameCube for Christmas that year. Oh. And it came with that game. So I just, I remember Christmas playing that game all night long. Um. Oh, Ross says also I'm Radivir on Discord. Both are fine. Oh, hey, Rat. Oh, I always say, is it Rad? What do you say? Radivir? Radivir? I don't know. I always I don't know. shorten your, in my mind at least, I always say Rad, which I'm sure you do not want to be called. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of, out. oh, you know what is also another one of my favorite games though for Mario? I love the original Paper Mario. And then I also really loved Super Mario Brothers 2. Oh, wait, that was one where you could turn into... That was the fun the thing to be a box one. or whatever. Or the Taku... Uh, whatever. I know what you're talking about, though. The little... Oh, my God. What's that called? Tanuki. Tanuki, Tanuki Mario. Yeah. Tanuki Mario. That's right. But you know what I think of whenever I think of that game is the... Dun, 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 dun. I always think of the desert music with oh, like the cactuses oh that like, do their hip motion back and forth. I just liked the um, color palette in that one, too. It's so weird. Yes. Because it wasn't it like it wasn't all the colors like normal. It was like kind of the weird kind of it, it this was like the sixteen bit era, I believe. Okay. I think That's you might be bit. thinking of the third one. Maybe. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking of Super Mario Brothers three. I'm yeah. sorry. Two was the one where you could play as Princess Peach. Yeah, and she'd do the thing where she like I don't know what she was she doing, like, but she like her like she like put her legs up like she's sitting in the air and like Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She just peruses down from the heavens. <laughs> yes, three is the one I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. See, I played it on, yeah, the NES version had this. That was how it looked like. Ooh. But then this is when it was on an SNES. The oh, colors were yeah, different. I played it on Nintendo. Yeah. Yes, that's what I think of. Dern, dern, or no, no, no. Oh, I love the map music. Yeah. Wait, where is the... I want a map view of the desert. I don't want to take up your time right now. Oh, I know. I feel like every I time know. I do this and you're like five minutes left and it's like, oh no. Well, yeah, I remember. I'm actually like, since I'm drawing smaller, I know I can oh, nail so you're this. you're being more reasonable for yourself this time. <laughs> Last week I was being super ambitious and I was just not having a good day because I was not drawing the fish well. And <laughs> it was a lot going on. That's why I made that video unlisted. <laughs> I was not having it. This one I actually like. Um, Felix says, I'm going to do digital because of all the pretty colors. Ooh. I'm excited I, to see that. No joke. I was this close to doing digital because I wanted to do the colors oh, you, of the conch. You should have. I feel like you like doing I know. I'm kind of getting back into digital again. 
It's like my secret little joy right now. Well, until the, all the cards are finished and all these commissions that I have backlogged are finished, I feel like I'm kind of trapped in this a weird zone where I can't fully express myself artistically. So it's a little frustrating right now, but I've been having a lot of good days recently where I was even able to order a bunch of, um, I don't know if I should say this, but I ordered a lot of puzzles as uh, demos and I really want to make my own puzzles. And uh, we ordered a bunch of uh, metal pins <laughs> and we got new t-shirts made. So like on the business side, things have been great, but I think I, I have, I've lost my balance a bit where sometimes I think when you're an artist who is also making it their career, there's that balance of artistic integrity and then financial success. And you always want to be somewhere in the middle where you're not compromising who you are as an artist, but you're also recognizing that to make money, you have to make products of some kind that are available for people. So that is currently where I'm at. And even though I've been doing this for a long, long time, it, the seesaw will teeter constantly. So it's it's always a balancing game and figuring out where you are uh, in it. Uh, oh, Amber, hello. My sister Amber's here. Oh, hello, hello, Amber. Oh, Henry says you guys are making a list on making a list of and keeping a track of everyone's names is sweet. Oh, well, thank you. That's been something <laughs> Tim's been doing since you've been streaming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've been... Back when I twitched for so long. Oh, Twitch. Well, I think because oftentimes people will make a username that... <laughs> Sometimes it was a little embarrassing. I know I had a couple people back in the day who had like really embarrassing ones, oh, no. and they requested it. They requested I call them something different. So this was like five years ago. So ever since then, I've always tried to call people by whatever they want to be called by. So I wish I could claim it as my own idea, but it's really not. And he says, seven years and I didn't know about such talent, or rather hard work and dedication. <laughs> um... Well, thank you. Oh, okay. Ivana says, did you go to art school? Kind of. So I went to the Illinois Institute of Art, which is now closed down, but I went for game art and design. So my background is more in 3D modeling and programming. We had some uh, art classes. Like we definitely had life drawing. We definitely had a perspective art class, stuff like that. But it was definitely more focused on the 3D and game design elements. So yes, I did make my own pixel art game that only I know where to find it and play it. And... Uh, I do know how to animate, I know how to 3D model, and I know how to digitally sculpt. But I found such a love with drawing that as soon as I graduated, I got a job teaching somehow, and I worked at a company called CG Cookie who specialized in 3D modeling in Blender, and my life just kind of took over from there, where uh, I think without CG Cookie, I don't know where I'd be right now. So I'm, I'm very thankful to them, and they treated me very well there. Mm. Got a lot of the warm ups on Discord. Mm. Potato. I love nautical drawings so Morgan. much. Morgan. Oh, those are so good, Morgan. I think I'm one of those people who, when oh, Mermaid yeah. comes around on Instagram, I actually follow the hashtag Mermaid2020. So, weirdly enough, I'm looking at a lot of undiscovered artists every day just from that hashtag because so many people use it that I am. I'm bound to see at least like four or five every time I'm just scrolling on Instagram for like five minutes. Oh, look, uh, Anna has these. Couldn't really get any light, any work on light and shadow. I really struggle with line weights and graphite. Ooh. Those are really good warm ups. Who is this? Um, this one's Anra. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, edges are a big thing when doing shells. And I think in. Even with this conch here, you can see how the left side, we're definitely gonna have to put a lot more work in with individualizing a lot of these highlights and these ridges. So don't worry if they take you a little longer on the left side versus the right, or the right side, sorry, instead of the left, because I know that you wanna get all those little, little nuanced details. Got Unix warmups here. Ooh. <laughs> they almost look like organic snails. Yeah, I like it. It's why, it's with it sideways, too. Like, mm -hmm. turning my head. Oh, you know what? I'm going to need you to refresh this. <laughs> oh, it did it. Oh, it's a third arm. It's way third arming right now. Third arm. That should be my next emoji. Just a third arm. <laughs> okay, there we go. Sorry for the little jump on screen. Uh, um, really quick, the trick that I do to make a subject matter pop out is I will lightly add a bit of value around the subject matter 
and that way it separates the subject matter from the background and oftentimes it gives quite a pop if there's a contrast if you have a darker background and then a lighter subject matter. Another little tip of the the trade. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Rada, well, oh my gosh, was, I have a on the sheet, hang on. Rad, Radavir says, <laughs> no worries, I actually like Rad. Hey, hey, okay, good. <laughs> Because in my mind, whenever I see your name on Discord, I think, oh, hey, Rad's talking. I'll still call you. I'll call, Tim will call you Rad. I'll call you Rachavia. Rachavia. Rach, I can't roll. I wish I could. Rach, I can't do it. Rach. The thing that I, I really struggle with with the French is the like the, the hacky sound. Oh, yeah. That's I, what I took French in wrong. high school. And... I think French is the most beautiful language there is. But I, it's really hard for me to do the part <laughs> they have a lot of rolling surprisingly i don't think people will realize um oh zale says my gamecube also came with that game oh, yes. we knew the gamecube would be an awesome console because the sunshine was so amazing right i know i was so excited and then i think there was um was it star fox adventures it was like maybe the second the game dinosaur I one there. everyone oh god i'm sorry i keep hitting your chair I, ready, right? I don't know why i spin on this chair all the time but yeah, Star Fox Adventures I know wasn't super popular or well received, but I loved that. I love that one too. Yeah, I don't know why. I thought it was. I'm gonna story say right now. Good. I think GameCube is severely underrated, and at the time it was hated on so mm. much because PlayStation PlayStation Two, I mean, kind of was the king of that era. But then you had a lot of guys going to Xbox because of Halo and all these other games. So the GameCube was kind of labeled as like the kitty console. But looking back now, when you look at it, that game had so many classics that I think even to this day are considered really good games. Because when you look at Smash Brothers, people still say Melee is the best Smash Brother game. Yeah. And probably. then Mario Kart Double Dash, in my opinion, is the best Mario Kart game. And then Mario Sunshine, I think, is my favorite Mario game. And then that's where Pikmin was born. There are so many games that came out on Game. I love Mario Tennis, the golf one. There's a lot of sports ones I like on that one. Oh my god, I forgot about, um, that's right, Pikmin started on GameCube, uh -huh. and then... And Pikmin 2 was on GameCube? That's right. There was a lot of good stuff on GameCube. There Actually, was so I did. much I good on GameCube. GameCube. They were the first ones to have the wireless controllers that didn't freak out on you, because I had one for PS2, but they sucked, the <laughs> Mad Cats ones. But then I got those, like, jumbo GameCube ones. Those were bomb. Those were so good. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I had the ones where you could um, have it repeatedly press a button for you. Oh, you cheater. I know I did. I had a, I had a cheating controller, but on Star Fox Adventures, there was a... I could not beat this. You had to press A repeatedly to, like, beat the leader of this tribe. It was like uh, pushing the bar. Whoever could push the bar more. It was like a... What do they call it? Arm wrestling. <laughs> Whatever. But yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't click the button fast enough, so the controller did oh, that's, it. That's another game I would can say, say is the best. I would say Mario Party 4 is my favorite Mario Party, oh, which serious? was also GameCube. Oh, I think Mario Party 2 is my favorite because the, the costumes. Th those were pretty fun. Yeah. And then, actually, Metroid Prime was on GameCube, <laughs> and that I still consider the best Metroid game. Um. Anyways, there's a couple questions I see people coming through. Back oh, to yes. art. Back to um, art. The reason we're right? here. Um. Let's see, Unix has advice on chaining the smooth part of the conch. So when I do smooth versus rough, when I do smooth areas, I tend to build it up very gradually, very slowly. Focus on the transition from one value to the next. That way you're not having a lot of harsh uh, breaking of um, a darker value and a lighter value next to each other. So whenever I know that there's, you, you can kind of see the fold in the middle of the smooth part of the conch, so in my own, I don't know how easy it is to see on camera, but basically I'm going to focus mostly on the shadows, but I'm still going to have this circular motion. And whatever motion works best for you for shading, but to have a smoothness to it, I like to build it up very softly and very slowly. And I will have the highlights be very much uh, prevalent. So everywhere on my conch is going to be slightly shaded except for the highlight area. So. When I'm doing something textured, oftentimes I might even lift up my pencil. So like, let me do this part of the shell. Oh, hang on, third, third hand is back, hang on. Oh, all right. third hand is alive and well. We are reconnected, all right, there we go. So when I'm doing something more rough, I might push into the paper a bit more and have uh, quite more stagnations and Actually, uh, breakage. It's hard because the conscious kind of 
blocking. Can I move this? Oh, you know what? I'll just move my paper. That's good. There, there we go. Yeah, I was like, blocking oh, sorry about that, that guys. Uh, so you can see how this I'm having more of a darker contrast in the way that I'm uh, working it up, and then the smooth area I'm like very gentle. Um, I, I someone called my way of working smooth areas butter. So I always think of having it be so smooth, it's like the surface of butter, you know, vegan butter that is, of course. <laughs> um, oh, Simon, hello, hello. Hey, Simon, <laughs> how you doing? Simon says, hello, just came to stop by and say, hey, hi. <laughs> hey, Simon. Um, let's see, there's another question too. So Enra and Mary were saying, um, why is your pencil not sharp? I actually don't like working with sharp pencils. Uh, I'm one of those weird people. Well, no, I'm not a weird person because Babs Webb does this too. She works with mostly dull pencils. You're a weird person, but that's okay. Actually, good point. Right. I am one of the strangest people I know. <laughs> but when it comes to drawing, as you can see, I actually work with the dullness of the pencil and I'll just turn it. And I know how thick the results will be when I push down on the paper. So as I'm building it up, I, I know how much I need. When you're working with a really sharp pencil, oftentimes you're getting a very, like where's my point two? When you're working with my point two, does this have lead in it? Oh no, I can't even do my demonstration. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, there it goes. So I'm working with my point two. You are getting like this very sharp uh, line that oftentimes is a little darker than what I want. And then to build up value consistently, I have to work very, very small. But when you work with a dull pencil, you can get that same level of smoothness in like half the time. And I know it's kind of hard to explain, but it's easier to know when you've worked with pencils over a long time. You kind of know when you need to work with a sharp one and when you can work with dull ones. And I know like my favorite artist or my favorite pencil artist, Lidging Le Legend, Alan <laughs> Williams, he uses a very sharp pencil, but his trick is he does not hold it like this, if you guys can see this. Don't, he doesn't hold it like this. He holds it quite a bit of ways, and oftentimes he works on the angle of the pencil to get a lot of the texture of the paper to be seen. And then he'll build it up. He'll like turn the pencil from being completely sideways. He'll turn it up to create more of a point. So there's different ways of handling a pencil into creating texture. Honestly, eventually, I know later in my life, I might get to more of the Alan Williams style of doing it. But because I'm still such a young and baby artist, I am going to continue working it uh, because this has a level of control that sometimes holding it sideways does not give you. But the problem is it doesn't give you that very beautiful paper, serene texture look that uh, sometimes I strive for, but it's really hard to do with, um, especially if you're working with a sharp pencil. This is not happening with a sharp pencil. If you want more paper texture, you want to either use the side of the pencil or use a dull pencil. Don't use a sharp pencil. Unless if you're like using pointillism or something, but that will even take longer, which I don't recommend. <laughs> oh, Simon says, I'm doing great. Hope you guys are doing well. How are you guys? How are you doing, Tim? This week's been really good for me. Like I've been in a really good mood this week. I was to say, yeah, you've had a, well, I feel like yesterday was great because you and I, we got to be outside a lot. Mm -hmm. um, that was nice. Clear Actually, out my spinach garden. I'm going to go blow my nose really quick, though, because allergies are the one thing that's not going Oh, yes, well yes. Me. Yeah, I was able to spend time with my parents on Sunday, and I, I helped make a puzzle, which was, I haven't done, worked on puzzles for a while, and I forgot how much I love working on puzzles. Uh, and I cleared up my spinach garden yesterday. I found the Criterion channel, and I found a lot of new movies. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just been really good. And I got a bunch of enamel pins or metal pins ordered. I mean, I'm definitely ready for uh, this quarantine to pass so that I can see people again. But as of right now, I'm feeling pretty good. All right, sorry. Oh. All right, allergies have not been going good for me, but I've been good. I've just been happy because, yeah, I feel like getting outside has been good for both of us, too. Just for a bike ride or gardening or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon says, I've been in a pretty good mood. I've been doing a lot of arts and stuff, working out a lot more than normal, too. 
Yeah, I've been seeing that in your story, Simon. That's awesome. But your art's been great. I liked your Gemini piece that you did. Especially being a Gemini. Um, Eddie says, do you even touch the paper with lead of pencil or it's almost non-existent feeling? Not existent feeling. I know for you it's there, but try to think about you from the past, maybe even start of serious drawing. Wait, so the first part of that question. Yeah, so do you even touch the paper with lead? With the lead of pencil? Yes. Or is that almost non-existent? Like, do you not, I think, he's, do you like feel your pencil touching the paper or does it almost feel like you're like hovering above it maybe um sometimes like on the side i'll just do a quick like scribble to know where my pencil is in terms of uh cause sometimes you'll catch yourself where your uh, the graphite can be sometimes fickle and you want to break that part because a fickle graphite pencil will create irregular results so sometimes i'll just kind of make sure that it's smooth before i start and then i'll go into it but honestly, I'm I'm kind of doing a I'm always I'm almost always touching the paper. It's like one continuous line. I I almost don't lift up my pencil at all, uh, unless if I'm trying to add texture specifically. So yeah, I would say I'm more of a hoverer, but I'm always touching the paper if that makes sense. I'm like gliding. It's like a skating over the image. Getting some good questions. Anra says, unrelated to the study, but while drawing from imagination, do you keep track of your highlights by marking them out, or do you rely on instincts to just feel where the highlight should fall? Uh, instincts. Oh, for sure, instincts. Um, I think it's good to have reference whenever, like if you're doing a skull drawing in your piece, I would definitely use reference and look at how the skull reflects lighting. But if you're just you know going for it and you're drawing something from your imagination, yeah. I think intuition should kind of take over and that's why having strong fundamentals is good. And as much as I think uh, fundamentals can be kind of really boring to work on, and I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about, they're necessary to work when uh, without references or when you're doing your own freeform stuff. So still always work on your fundamentals. Make sure you understand lighting and form and how to build it up, all that good stuff. We are past the first 30 minutes, so we have an hour left, everyone. Oh, I'm feeling good. We yeah. have an hour left? Yeah. Oh, I'm You're... feeling good. Something else that the conch has that's really okay. interesting is it has a lot of texture near the spire, and then it kind of melts into the smoothness. So you can see some of the texture and some of the red dotting going into the top here, like this area, and then it kind of melts into the more porcelain-looking part of the inside of the shell. So that'll be a fun transition to cover too. <laughs> Simon says, oh, super fun to make. And I didn't know you were even better. Yes, I'm a Gemini. Simon had a really cool, actually, I can link your Instagram, Simon, since I'm doing this. You can check out his Gemini drawing. Do, do, do art with shy. There we go. I was like linking. <laughs> there we go. But yes, I'm a Gemini. I feel like Geminis have some uh, bad reputation for being two-faced, but I think it's just adapting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh yeah, Enra has another question too. Actually, even with studies, how do you make, how do you keep track of your lighting? Because it seems like if you just try to follow contours by looking and comparing from reference, it's easy to forget the shape. Uh, I think before I even start, I think of where the light source is coming from. So in this picture, it's very much prevalent to me that it's overhead. And uh, that is always a good reminder of where the light source will be coming from. So a good example is on the conch, on the textured side, the highlights are more centered, and then I know that I'll pillow shade it, which means the lighting will be strongest in the middle, and then it'll kind of fade out onto the edges, which will be the darkest, most likely, unless there's bounce light, which there is some of that going on here. So I think studies like this are really good at making you uh, 
forced to see where your lighting is coming from and how to capture that lighting to best represent it in your own work. So that's why I like these kind of studies because they, they make you think about, oh wow, is that shadow really there? Or, oh wow, that bounce light really makes the, this area in the shadow much lighter than I would have originally thought. So that's why I like these kind of studies because it forces you to look on things like value and form and light. So yeah, I guess when you're doing this kind of stuff uh, and if lighting is your priority, actively observe and analyze what you're seeing in the reference and how that makes sense to you uh, from a, a standpoint of where is the light source coming from? And if you're able to answer that question, then you're able to deepen your understanding of lighting. Actually, uh, Zatrick says, do you know or have or have you made any tutorials on lighting? I did with CG Cookie. I don't think I have any on my personal YouTube, but I will be talking to my old boss probably this week about them because I want to get at least one of those back. I did do a whole series on subsurface scattering. Uh, so that one would be really fun to cover. And actually, maybe that will be one of the tutorials I can bring back. Because subsurface scattering is basically when you hold your light to a flashlight or like your fingers and you see the red through the, the light, that is subsurface scattering. Or when you hold up a leaf to the sun and it has like this bright neon green look, that's subsurface scattering. And that's another like good example and study of how does lighting work in the real world and how, how can I bring that into my own work. So that's why I think doing a lot of realism studies um, can be good for your more imaginative work. Let's see. <laughs> Vic says, oh no, I've been drawing all day and at this point, 10 p.m., my wrist is starting to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, good work drawing all day, but yeah, give your wrist a break if it's starting to hurt. <laughs> or you can do Tim's stretching tutorials. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely check those out. I have three stretches basically that you can do to help alleviate pain. I'll say, I don't know, I don't hear, you don't really have too many issues with your wrist, surprisingly, for how much you draw, but is that because mm -hmm. you're stretching all the time, you think? Well, I'm a very, I'm what would be called a soft-handed artist, so I'm not pushing into the paper very hard, where people that are, like, really pushing and holding it tight, but since I hold it so loose anyways, it doesn't really affect me. Um, but when I work digitally, I usually will feel a little bit more pain, because digitally I do have to push into the tablet a bit more, so... If you're noticing you have a lot of hand pain, uh, and if I mean if you work digital, definitely change the settings so that it is more sensitive to the pressure and how much you're putting on. And then if you're working traditionally, it usually might mean that you could just work with a darker pencil. That way it will help you kind of pull off a bit. Uh, you might be working with too light of a pencil and that's what's causing you to push into the paper more. Hmm. Felix says digital is way easier. The only trouble is finding that balance between either overly smooth airbrush and then way too rough texture brushes that look flat. Yes, I think uh, a lot of younger artists can get caught in the trap of digital art where they can create things way more efficiently in terms of a timely manner, but oftentimes it has that digital look where it just looks either too airbrushed or it looks too choppy and it doesn't really have this nice finish that I think we're all striving to hit. So with digital art, even though I would also consider it a bit easier, I think it can be tricky in understanding how to not make it look quote unquote digital or how to not make it look like an amateur digital artist mistake. So I think a good mixture of using soft and hard brushes or just working with um, a textured brush or uh, I know even Pete Morbacher who does Angel Air, and he works with a very simple, a very simple hard edge. I think it's even a circle brush, really. And he can make it look uh, smooth by doing a lot of layering and gradation throughout his piece. So don't let brushes run your digital pieces. I would say make sure that you're still in control of your digital work. Just your uh, brushes are help creating either a texture or help creating 
more of a time effective um, technique to make whatever you're making. All right, really quick, I'm gonna switch to my, cause how much time do I have left, 15 minutes? I'm gonna switch to my 0.2 mechanical pencil and I'm gonna start edging some things out and adding more detail here. Simon, I, I think this is in regards to Gemini. It's legit after looking it up and stuff, that was a very common thing that came up. <laughs> yeah, they don't have the best reputation, but. <laughs> I'm not caught up though. Everyone's drawing today. It's been hey. right. Well, and I guess I can kind of make note of what I'm doing here is I'm going through and I'm first looking at areas where there's a lot of tight contrast. So on this upper area here, where there's more of a textured part of the top of the conch, I can kind of push some of these darker edges. And I might lose some of my realism here, just so I can push more of my own style of uh, drawing. Because like I said, even with a lot of these studies, I don't expect you guys to be doing um, realism studies if you want to add a bit more of your flair to them. I think it's always good to do more of a realistic study and then have that influence your um, work outside of it. But if you want to take this time to also kind of show your flair, that's totally okay. Because I'm going to add some harsh edges, which obviously isn't something that would appear in real life, but I like having them in my own work. So I need them here. So I'm looking at the reference and I'm really trying to create these ridges of light and shadow. There. And I can also look at the shaping of things because oftentimes when I get lost in doing the outline, sometimes my, my actual shapes can be just a little too large or a little <laughs> too small. So this is my time to correct them. Well, this is nice because I feel like the last couple, you've been kind of down to the wire. Oh, for sure. Yeah, where you can actually take your time with this one, which is fun. No, I came into this drawing <laughs> with an agenda. I was like, I'm going to make this look good. I'm going to make sure I have enough time to give myself to be able to make it look good. And I feel like drawing a conch is so up my alley for something that should be pretty comfortable doing. I was like, I'm not messing this up today. So I came with an agenda. I came in with a, a bullheaded confidence. I was like, let's do this. Hmm. What? Um, no, because I was looking up the subsurface scattering thing, but then I was like, what's the name for light that shines through trees? You know what I mean? When you're like in a forest and there's light that shines through the trees. Oh, I mean, there's a lot of nicknames like God Rays. But or... there's no English name for it. But oh, that would make sense. There's, there's a Japanese word for that specific thing, though. It's... Yeah, I can read yeah, it. Yeah, you can read it. Where is it? Komorebi. 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 Yeah, there's no English word for that specific situation, though. No. The more you know. Right? The scientific term is crep crepuscular rays, crep crepuscular rays, which describes beams of light shining through the environment. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so the other thing that I'm doing here with, I can kind of capture with my 0.2 pencil is I can add these little lines of texture to imply more structure, more ridges within it. Where with the inside of the conch, it has a very smooth uh, kind of flow to it. But where it's a little rougher, I can add more texture to it. Sometimes that can be done just by pushing little lines into the paper to create the illusion of um, those, those really small ridges. Hmm. Ivana says, I'm going to go now, but have, have fun drawing. Take we'll care. We'll see you around, Ivana. Thanks for stopping.
I'm trying to think of something good to talk about that we did. We got some more plants yesterday. No, we didn't get plants. We just got like. <laughs> I got one. You got I got one a plant. Dalmatian plant. Oh yeah, what's that? I call it spots. Is that the one we have on the front? What's the one we have on the front porch right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's spots. That's spots. Spots is cute, and it attracts hummingbirds. Um, we got the grass cut yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Our grass compared to the neighbor's grass wasn't the best this week. I feel like the first grass cut of the year, some people are really early with it, and then people like us, I think I usually wait till like mid-May to cut the grass the first time. I'm not a fan of cutting the grass, to yeah. be honest. I love so cutting I'm glad the that grass. you like cutting the grass, because then that works out. <laughs> I don't really have form when I cut the grass, though. I usually, it's really weird, but when I cut the grass, and I've always done this even with my parents' yard, I do the perimeter first. Oh, no, I think that's pretty normal. Do you do the... Okay. Yeah. So I kind of do, like, the perimeter cut, and then I do it in sections. Like, our yard, we have these two trees, so everything in front of those trees I do first back and forth, and then I, like, do a weird... I cut the other direction then when I do the other half. I don't know. Oh, no. I was always taught, well, you do the perimeter first, and then you go back and forth, and you can either do it at an angle where it creates, like, that whole angled look, Yeah. but when you go down a line, when you come back, you have to go halfway... On the area you already did, and yeah. then half on new. Oh, yeah, I do that. No, you do not. Yes, I do. I keep the tire slightly to the right of the other tire mark, where you can kind of see it, you know? I guess I'd have to look yeah. outside to see your work. Because I know I used to get in trouble if I didn't do that. Oh, my dad my... would make me redo it. My Well, my dad, too, is one of those people that, like, every time you cut, you should do it a different direction, because it helps it grow in better. Oh, yeah, over. you just go back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yeah, well, you should do, no, like, when you cut the next time, then you should do it a different way than you did the last time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like, the next time you cut the grass. Right? Yeah, All yeah, these yeah. grass things that go on, but we had a riding mower, though, growing up, so that was kind of nice. We just had a big <gasps> yard. What? I never had a riding mower. But I would still cut the perimeter with the push mower, and then I would do everything else in the riding mower. Oh, I... Right? And I would just get my headphones on, turn on a podcast. No, I mean, it would take like, like cutting the grass. Well, it was like it took two hours. No, I like the push more too because you get a good podcast or some good tunes going, and you're all set. <laughs> oh, Amy's here. Hey, Amy. Hello, Amy. I actually, have your mermaid behind me right now. Alice and I hope you're enjoying the nice weather. I hope you and Alice are enjoying the nice weather too, Amy. You can sit outside at least right now. It's not like you're gonna freeze your butt off. Yeah, it's, it's like that nice. perfect tub, too, where you don't get too hot or too cold. <laughs> Felix says, two months into Japanese on Duolingo. I can read all the hiragana? Hiragana? Katakana? And katakana. And some kanji, right? Yep. Yeah, spoken Japanese is still tough to understand, though. I'm right there with you. I learned, I used to be able to write all of hiragana and katakana uh, pretty well. And then I knew some kanji. <laughs> Uh, speaking is weird because you have to think backwards in terms of if you're normally an English speaker. Uh, learning Japanese is very strange because it reworks the way that you talk and the way that you hear. So in a lot of ways you'd hear like, I go to the store, where in Japanese it would be store I go to. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. And then you don't even say I. It's very weird for Japanese people to say, actually, I is watashi wa. So you, you usually don't hear that unless if it's very direct or specific. So a lot of things are implied, which is even more strange for people that speak English primarily, because everything is very, well, I mean, English isn't easy either. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to learn English, English is its own weird uh, language. But I always found Japanese to be very difficult to learn. But I, I did strive to learn it. I got pretty far. I just don't understand why grammar rules changed. For English? Yeah, just between languages. Like, I don't know how languages came to be necessarily, but... Um, I mean, it's all location-based yeah. and I think uh, it's region-based. Really. Interesting, yeah. Well, no, there's some languages that are really hard to like translate, I feel like, just because it's... The grammar is so different and the sentence, sentence structure is very different. That's why learning new languages, I think, was hard for me because I can't... It's hard for me to, like understand english it's hard enough understanding grammar <laughs> so other languages is always really hard then <laughs> well, i feel like western and eastern european languages would probably be the easiest for native english speakers to learn because a lot of it is oriented in like i mean spanish and uh french oh yeah spanish and 
I think the only thing with Spanish and French that are weird is just the feminine, masculine. Yeah, that always caught me up in high school. Um, I think that's the weird part is you have to like, even describing uh, anything in the room, you have to use, you can change it, I guess. I mean, I can speak a little Spanish. <laughs> you I started doing, Espanol un poco. I did a month of Spanish on Duolingo because I did I French in high school and I don't remember any of it. But I was like, you know, Spanish might be nice because I feel like a lot of people do speak Spanish. Should be nice just to be able to communicate easier. I remember when you started that. I was like, there's no. I way did a month straight go every day. This. I really should go back to doing that. I get the notif. You know how Duolingo sends you the notifications all the time too. I get them every day. <laughs> Still. Uh, yes, yeah, it's not giving up on me. Um. Oh yeah, Simon says, "Oh, keys, friends. I gotta go. Don't be strangers. Have a good stream. Good to see you, Simon." The what? I said, Simon says, okay, friends, I gotta go. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Did I talk fast? Sorry. Don't be strangers. I Don't be strangers. Have a good stream. Take care, Simon. Take care, Simon. I know one day we'll hop on a game of League with you. Tim has been all into the, the cards lately. I've been very, I've been actually pretty proud of myself. I've been very focused and I've been working on my five foot aquatic drawing. Yeah, you get your hour in every day. Yeah, it's been good. Um... Oh, Vic says English is my third language out of four, and it was the easiest to learn. <laughs> really? I always hear that English is weird because our words don't... Like, in Japanese, if you see a letter A, it'll always pr be pronounced ah. And then if you see the letter I, it's always pronounced E. Or in English, the letter A can be pronounced so many ways, like A, ah, uh, E. I think that's most of them. Ah. Where, uh, and I know that sometimes Americans, we have a bad habit of just making up words. And I'm sure if any English, proper English speak, people listening to the stream right now would say that Americans butcher the English, English language. And I would kind of agree with that. Because I know I make up words all the time. Um, that's crazy though, Vic. I feel like you definitely have a, because they say, um, People that know like multiple languages, like your brain, you can really comprehend those things well. I think that's really cool that you know four languages. Mm -hmm. um, Jay Shrek says in Hebrew, the words are also switched around and I'm currently learning it in school. That'd be a really interesting oh, language to learn too. Hebrew is another, I think Hebrew is really pretty, the way that certain words are phrased. I think the only languages that I think are a little harsh to my ear or that I'm not the most like yeah i want to listen to that dialect would be german even though i am german primarily uh russian and chinese those are the three where i'm like it always just sounds a little harsh to me or i guess chinese always sounds like shah, shah. there's a lot of like shah, shah, shah. Yeah. and then german and russian are like harsh <laughs> like it's very harsh it's not like natural to speak for us i guess well it's very it's very strong sounding where i've always like love languages i think that's why french sounds really pretty and then spanish can sound really pretty and then if you use the right words in english those can sound pretty too i guess i think germans want to listen to really yeah I think not my it's favorite just, i don't know I, sometimes the words everything sounds very similar when it's spoken but it's their own words i think it's cool um Let's see, because oh yeah, Felix says we put the verb at the end in sub sentences in German, so it's kind of easier to put your mind in that mode. So, but the, yeah, we put the verb at the end in sub sentences in German, so it's kind of easier to put your mind in that mode. Interesting. Oh, weird. So you're getting, you're kind of understanding the action. I mean, I definitely end. want to visit Germany, considering that's where I'm from primarily. It's so pretty there. I'm trying to, I was in Stuttgart. Well, everyone area. that I've met that's from German, they're very, uh, very rooted. They just seem very, uh, they don't seem like very wishy-washy. Like they have a very set way of doing things and they feel good about that way, which I think I am very much that way too. We, um, oh my gosh, my, well, cause my dad does manufacturing. He works with stuff. So we went to, I went to him with, to Germany once on a business trip and the, one of the, the plants there, oh. they're. Uh, the factory that I went to, at least, it was so much more different than the American factories. It was just so organized, clean, 
yeah. right? They had tons of windows in there, so you still got a lot of sunlight. Because a lot of American factories you go into and you don't. Yeah, it's dark. They're spending their entire, and they do those long shifts, so it's 12 to 14 hour shifts. They're stuck in this factory with like barely any sunlight. Um, so yeah, the German factory that I went to at least, I don't know, I'm sure there's some German factories like that, but it was so clean and well put together. And everyone was super nice. That's what I mean. They just seem very structured. Yeah. Or at least that's the impression I've gotten so far. <laughs> um, Amy says English is a conglomerate language. So conglomerate language, but it's Germanic based. Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French, and bases off of are based off of it- oh. Latin. So that's why they're so different. I also like Italian. Have you heard Latin? Yeah. That's a fun. I it's fun to listen to. Is puer, which is boy. I don't know why that's the only word I remember. I wouldn't necessarily consider like a lovely language to listen to but it's a fun language to listen to i think latin's cool because if you can learn latin they say then learning other languages might become easier too because that's like a whole different grammatical base oh yeah and so many of our words are based on latin origin hebrew though i would love to learn i don't i guess i don't know hebrew that well it's just pretty even their um just i don't know i think it's another like you call it love language or whatever well, it's interesting because I did that. I did a show at a Jew, Jewish retirement uh, facility, and they had uh, a Jewish, um, a little synagogue that they were giving a sermon in. And I actually heard them read from the Torah, I believe it's called. So I remember hearing it, but I can't remember it. But I remember it being pretty fast. And a lot of, it kind of rolls into itself, if that makes sense. Like one sentence will roll into the next without it feeling like it stops. Hmm. I love the look of it, though. I think Hebrew is a very pretty uh, character language. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did a Passover thing once, and that was really cool. They did the entire Passover in Hebrew. I <laughs> Morgan says my entire mom's side of the family is Spanish. I'm the only one who can't. I'm the only one who ain't fluent. <laughs> I understand when it's spoken to me pretty well, but I can't respond very well. If anything, I feel like that's me with some languages. I like feel like I can kind of structure at least Spanish. I feel like I can structure what they're saying, but I cannot, for the life of me, be able to speak <laughs> it back to them or reply to it. Um, Felix says English has a huge vocabulary compared to other languages. But being able to speak basic English is very easy. <laughs> I guess, yeah, getting the the important things said. I feel like, yeah, we do, we create a lot of words for things. Like bootylicious. <laughs> do you know that was added to the dictionary? Bootylicious? Yes. No way. Beyonce added it to the dictionary. Oh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, put... Bootylicious dictionary. No, no, put dictionary. Bootylicious dictionary. How did Beyonce get that? Oh my god, it shows up on Merriam Webster. I told right. you. So they say if a word gets recognized and established and recognized as like a true word and it's understood, it'll get added <laughs> to the dictionary. So the dictionary acknowledges it's a slang word, but it says voluptuously sexy and attractive. <laughs> I love how they're trying to, like, knock it, but not knock it. <laughs> they're trying to become Urban Dictionary as well. I was well. going to say, they're like, yeah. this should be on Urban Dictionary, but because we're forced to. Um, that's interesting. Bootylicious. Only Bootylicious. Beyonce. Real word. Well, I'm sure there's other words that we probably commonly <coughs> use that wouldn't think would be in the dictionary. But, like, I'm oh, sure yeah. meme. I'm sure trigger. I'm like, sure. What's another, like, word? Yeah, memes on. Is bay. Bay is a BAE, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. See. Wow. Uh, that's weird. <laughs> um. Oh yeah. Anwar says, as a native Hindi speaker, English pronunciations were the worst, but there's thankfully mm. a lot of media to pra- around to practice. That's true. Um. Unix says, "Why did I know you'd say German to not listen to?" Ah. I think because even my art, I think it's very representative that I, I I like soft. I like there being strength, but it being very, I don't want to say feminine, because I think a lot of people call my word my work feminine, but I would rather use the word like soft or gentle. And I think when I hear 
German or Russian, it doesn't sound very soft or gentle. Even if you could be saying the softest things in like a sentence, but if you say it in German, it'll sound just a little more harsh. Nicolina says German is soft though, actually. The what is? Nicolina says German is soft though, or so soft though. I I guess I would have to listen. If you send me a YouTube video of like very soft, beautiful German, <coughs> because I think as an American, Spoken we only hear word. it. <laughs> Spoken word, poetry in German. Well, I feel like we always hear it in such like a harsh um dialect because of the context that it's usually given in because i feel like a lot of the media that we watch that has german speaking parts in it are usually like dictarian or well it could be stereotypical harsh. stuff maybe or because even not like even, not uh, even just, i think about not the, nazi stuff though what is the swedish chef even do like they definitely like make it so like over the top <laughs> the swedish chef <laughs> i guess i want to i want to hear it though because I've always associated with being harsher, but obviously I could be very ignorant in the fact that I just may have not have heard it in a different way than the way that I see it in media or film. And I have, I've never been to Germany, and I, I'm not around a lot of native German speakers, so clearly I'm not a good representation of uh, what is a pretty language what's not. So yeah, if you could send me a good video of like maybe just reading a bedtime nursery or something. <laughs> I guess I could Google this on my, my own too. Because I'm mostly German. I'm 50% German. Oh, so yeah. you would think that I would be more attracted to it. Oh, yeah. That was the other thing when I was in Germany. We went to this really cool transportation museum. or It had to be a car factory. But they had, like, eras of transportation. So they had full, like, these old trains inside of this place. But they were old passenger trains you could actually go on and oh. see. And... It was basically a museum that went from the beginning of time for transportation and they had actual models or the actual what they used. And then it kind of just you walk the museum and it eventually got to like future travel, stuff like that even. It was a cool museum. Yeah, that's neat. Um, I love that. I'm not the biggest car fan because they did have a lot of cars there, but it was I just like transportation or just seeing innovation I think is really cool. Um, it's kind of... It's artistic in a way, too, just seeing how people came up with new ways to move people. <laughs> oh, sp actually, speaking of languages, I find Icelandic to be super cool. Icelandic, I am going to say this now, and you can you can argue with me if you think I'm uh -oh. wrong. I think that was the hardest language to learn. I even tried learning Japanese, and I got pretty far into it. But when I tried to learn Icelandic, I can't even get my mouth to form the right shape to form the words. Oh. I don't know if you've ever, like, if you, I don't know if you've ever heard Icelandic. Most Icelandic, like, I guess people are, song, songs people I know all sing in English, though. Oh, yes. Yeah, they can... Monsters and Men, I think, is probably the one Icelandic band I think I listen to. And well, they, also Sigurós, Bjork. Oh, Sigurós. But they all sing in either, well, Sigurós is his own kind of language, and then Bjork doesn't sing, though, right? No, Bjork sings. Does he sing in English, though, right? Bjork's a girl. <laughs> you don't know I who Bjork is? I don't. I, I know. I think I do. Hang on. Be, just type in Bjork. No, no not New York. Uh, that was a typo, Tim. <laughs> do all is full of love. Oh, I shouldn't do this because it's going to trigger it. Oh, that's remember. right. We yeah. can't do it on stream. Or else my video will get taken down. Literally a second of it, and it captures it. Um, I'm trying to think of... I don't want to sing it. <laughs> Uh, but do you know the it's so quiet shh, shh. and then like it keeps going that builds in I don't know what you're doing <laughs> I don't know I don't know babe, I, I don't know if I listen to Bjork I oh know I babe I thought you would actually like Bjork I probably would I'm all into uh, I'm listening to the donkeys right now I have a very different music taste than Tim though I like a lot of the donkeys. My they were like, the music is just really different. Are right, like mainstream? I don't listen to things. I'm an e boy. I don't listen to things that other people listen to. I don't listen to what <laughs> uh, the general population listens to. I listen to what YouTube recommends for okay, me. That's more you. Which I is listen different. To Rush, I listen to Bjork. I'm just an individual with individual tastes Tim, that you wouldn't understand. That's oh my gosh. But anyways, the donkeys is really cool because they're just this like guitar strummy. I'm very different. I'm very different. Me and Sean probably have more similar music tastes than we just listen to music that is not well known, and because of that fact, it's better. Kind of. <laughs> 
I was in that I was in that phase for a while though where if I found a song on Spotify, I would YouTube it right away to see how many views it had on YouTube. No. Yes. And I'd be like, oh why would you care? Because I think sometimes it's like I want to find something that's unique. So then when other people hear it, they're like, wow, oh this is gosh. a good song. I, Wait, I, I gotta wash my hands because I want to do some finger rubbing, but they're way too oily. So it would smudge really bad. So I'll be right back. Oh right. yes, yes, yes. You can talk about your individual music taste. Oh yeah. Let's see. I can go through my Spotify playlist. The Donkeys. Let's see. I like. Oh yeah, Pastel Ghost is good. Obviously, Glass Animals is great. What are some music choices you guys have? Oh yeah, I like Crystal Castles, but then I realized there was a whole scandal with their group, which is not good. Um, so that I don't listen to as much. What else do I listen to? I like St. Vincent. I like, I'm just saying everything I like. Oh God. I like 1975. Right, stop, stop. <laughs> but I think the whole argument of, because I was always taught in high school with art, is if, if it's popular, if most people like it, then it must be bad. That's how my art teacher would view it. And honestly, I've yeah, kind of changed good. my opinion of it over the years because uh, with film, I'm such a film nerd. But since I'm not involved with it at all, I can give a very much crit critic or a critic third person view of it. And I see a lot of people that will knock on a movie just because it's popular. Hmm. Like, I think Titanic is the best example of I think Titanic is actually a really well made movie. And I watch a bunch of movies and I'm into the weirdest crap you'll ever hear of. But Same I will watches. still, yeah, I will argue, movie, yeah. but I will argue that Titanic is really great because then people always be like, oh no, Titanic sucks. Blah, blah. I'm like, well, why? And they'll be like, oh, I just, and then like, they will try to give an answer. But then I'm like, well, what about the costume production? Didn't you think that? What about the music sound editing? Didn't you think that was pretty good? And they, they really don't dissect it into what actually they don't like. They just know that since it's popular, it can't be great. So I think, oh, that's I mean, don't get me wrong. There are most things that are popular in film, I would argue, is actually bad. Uh, I won't say names because I think I'll get in trouble. But <coughs> I wouldn't always use that as the case. I think music is something similar. I think pop music gets a bad rap. But even Sean, who his favorite genre is jazz, and he considers himself a music snob, he'll admit that some jazz or pop music he really enjoys. And he thinks it's boppy, it's catchy, it, it does its job. Steven Suchan sounds like something Schwa would like. Hmm. Wait, is this because I found? I think I found him on YouTube. Is he the one that did "Call Me by Your Name"? The, oh, Steven. Steven Suchan. Yeah. Oh yeah. Not only did he "Call Me by Your Name," you should listen to his actual albums. Yes. I probably would like it. I do. I sometimes like Very acoustic good. I've been getting back into that stuff too. But I also oh. like. Hold on. Uh -oh. Actually, really quick, because if you're going to recommend Steven Suja, I, or, uh, I literally, how do I find what I've liked on YouTube? Um, go to, <laughs> so um, is it library? This. No, click that, see the thing on the top. Oh left. yeah, there we go. Yeah, and then liked videos. Liked videos. All right, guys, I'm showing my age here. Yes. Just make sure. I don't literally click it, just don't like, click it, don't click it. Oh I my gosh. literally just liked one yesterday. It was his album... Or the Eve soundtrack, um, and the untitled All Delighted People. You know what? I'll I'll just link it on Discord yeah, later. But I loved listening. I was drawing to that yesterday. Okay, so you it's funny you bring that up. That on YouTube, I think, in the comments, oh, yeah. you could do that. By the way, we have twenty three minutes left. Sorry, I didn't give the. I don't think I announced thirty minutes. Oops, and I got clicked. That's great. All right. So now that we're in our final 20 minutes, I think it's good to really hyper-focus on those details. Make your shell shine. <laughs> Push those highlights. And I'm, I'm really enjoying this one. But Anne, yeah, thank you for recommending. I'm actually going to listen to some of that later. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm going to use the bathroom very quickly. I'm going to see if I was just trying to see if I had a question to leave you off with, though, before I walk away. Oh, yes. Um, I feel like if we leave you with something about movies. Chris says, I feel like Avatar is one of those movies, too. 
Yes. How do you feel about Avatar? I don't know. So, I don't know okay. Before. Avatar to me has a different experience because I saw it in the IMAX, the whole experience when that first kind of came out. And I saw it in 3D back when 3D was so popular that every movie wanted to be in 3D because Avatar did in 3D and did so well. That movie to me was an experience. I was in the theater and I really felt it. It was the first time I've ever watched a 3D movie where I felt it. So I'd have to watch it again, not in a theater, to give more of a um, analysis on the actual uh, way it shot in the story. Because I think I was so focused on the feeling that it gave me uh, that I had such a positive experience with it. And, you know, they say that if a movie viewing experience is very personal, then it shouldn't really matter what other people think of it. If you really enjoyed it, that's what matters. But I think when it comes to movies as experiences, oftentimes our opinion of it becomes biased or elevated because of our emotional response to it. So if I watch a really sad movie that I connect with, sometimes I'll be biased and give it a higher rating than maybe it should. But I think I'm also very much willing to admit it's because of my personal connection with it. So I think Avatar as a story, I think I'd have to rewatch it again to give a, a real critique of it. But I will say the experience of watching in a theater with IMAX 3D was phenomenal. So I will give it that. I'm trying to think of another popular movie that usually gets crapped on that I actually think is pretty good. Oh, one of my favorite movies of all time has a like 60 on Rotten Tomatoes, and I think it is absurd that it is below 100%, and that is The Fall. If you guys want to watch a truly artistic masterpiece, and I think one of the best movies in terms of storytelling, because it's one of those stories within a story, which I, I tend to like, I will admit I'm biased on that, but I think this one does it perfectly. And it's by Tarsum. He filmed it over four years in like 13 different countries, and it is beautifully crafted. So that's one of those movies that I fully, wholeheartedly disagree with critics, and I will push and recommend as much as I can to people. Astrid's just sitting outside of our door right now, but she doesn't want to come in. Uh, she's Astrid. just pissed that we're not taking her outside. Astrid, come on. Yeah. Here she comes. Oh, well, hi, Astrid the cat. Window right now for you, Astrid. There's an open window, some fresh air. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Our little Welcome calico hi, has the entered the room. Our little calico nightmare is what I call her. Oh, hi, baby. Hi. Come say hi to everybody on the stream, Master. She will not like this. She will hate this. She's going to hate this. You know, for how often you wake us up, I feel like we can put you on the stream for a second. Yeah, last night, this this bundle of joy decided to sleep on my neck. So I woke oh, up no. like trying to catch my breath, and I was like, why am I choking? It was because she put her whole body weight on my neck. <laughs> Do you remember this? Are you trying Astrid. to kill me? Oh, there she goes. She's like my attempt at work. <laughs> she has been... Well, I think because we tease her with the outside, because we open the back door so she can smell and look outside. But then if she sees one of us outside, she gets pissed. Because sometimes we'll let her out, but we can't always let her out because then we have to watch her. But if we're outside and she can see that we're outside, she is pissed. Um... <laughs> <laughs> She has been. I'm almost done with this. I feel like I did really good with time management today. How's everyone else feeling right yeah, now? Yeah, how are you guys <laughs> doing with yours? Actually, I can give some little editing here and there. Uh, let's see. I feel like I've got behind in comments a little bit. We were talking there. Let's see. Here we go. Zeal says, I found the strangest part of learning another language is when a word exists in one language, but not the other. Like mm -hmm. toe and wave, like waving hello, don't have words in Spanish. Oh. I think that's why it's really hard for me to look, because I feel like English was probably my favorite subject in school. I was one of those weird, I loved grammar. I loved breaking down sentence structures too in English by conjunctions, doing the breakups, help, I like the comma part of it. What um, function? Do you remember too where you break down sentences, like you do the paragraph? graphs for um something <laughs> i feel like you're talking to the wrong person i hated english i, I loved like english. by far my least favorite i subject. loved writing yeah those classes 
And I hate to admit, I also hated history, which I think you like. Um, I liked, I did like history too. Because it for me, it's almost like story time. It's real life story time. You're just learning about crazy things that happen in history. Yeah. I know I wish I was more into it because I, I can at least admit that there's so much resource and um, there's such a good core of knowledge that can be learned. But for some reason, it just doesn't attract me. Oh, yeah. Even just weird history. If you just YouTube weird history, you can find some cool videos yeah. just on really weird things that happen in history. Which you know what I was excellent, though, in biology? I was in honors bio and then honors chemistry. For those of you that are in high school, though, chemistry and biology are not the same thing. I figured since I was so good at biology, I would rock it in chemistry. So I did the highest AP honors chem oh, in high no. school. That was effing difficult <laughs> i had to memorize the periodic table in week two. Oh my gosh that was awful did they quiz did you actually have to fill in the yes. table they gave oh, us a bl- they gave us a blank no. table we had it not only do we have to memorize it we had to memorize the two letter hyphenated or uh i don't know what that would be called the two letter versions of so like hydrogen would be h god i don't even remember anymore is it just h h y but yeah that was awful <laughs> Oh, yeah, and all of, some of them are really weird. Like gold was a a U or N A or something. It was really weird. So it wasn't just like G O is gold. Oh god, it was, yeah. Oh, the it was periodic awful. table. That stuff I sucked at though. I don't. I didn't do good at stuff where you had to memorize large quantities of things like that. Oh. That's why I don't think I was a school person. Though. I don't have the best memory, <laughs> and I feel like a lot of stuff for school is just memorizing, basically. I mean, basically. But I liked. Actually, believe it or not, I did the best on tests that were more um, essay responses. Because when I start talking something out of my head and then writing it out, then I can usually actually remember stuff. Yeah, but if it's just favorite. straight, like, memorize facts and answer a question, I, I never did good with that. I did do, you're going to laugh, but my favorite, one of my favorite classes in high school, we had a, oh, what was it even called? I think it was called Detective Fiction. <laughs> Detective fiction? I took a semester of detective fiction. <laughs> what? That's a thing? Yeah, so that's where I read like 39 Steps. I read a lot of Agatha Christie. And it was great. I actually really enjoyed that. That sounds fun. And yeah. the class that I thought I was going to really enjoy, I didn't enjoy, which was Shakespeare. And oh, gosh, Tim. Weirdly yeah. enough, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, I went into that being like, I'm going to love this. This is going to be my favorite thing. And I went into it, I was like, it was okay. I, don't know, I, I wasn't that into it. It's funny because I really appreciate a lot of what Shakespeare did for, I guess, literature or storytelling, but I cannot read any of those. Well, what's I funny? I can watch plays. Like I like watching Shakespeare plays, but actually reading Shakespeare is really hard to do. <laughs> what's funny is now that I'm older, I went. It was actually like three weeks ago. For whatever reason, I was oh, I was researching fairies, and I looked up Titania and Puck, and then I got led into Midsummer's. And as I was reading it again, because they like had passages next to pictures, I was like, this is beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if my brain in high school just wasn't able to comprehend the structure that he wrote in. But now as an adult, since I read so slow anyways, I'm like just creating pictures in my head. Oh, I'm sure it's, I guess if that's the way you read it, I guess. When I, I don't know about you, but when I read, I attach visuals to words and feelings to words so like when i hear dark cherry wine i get a feeling of like warmth and like luxury Hmm. so when i think that's why i like lana del rey so much is because she'll put words in her lyrics that she associates with feelings so that's why you hear a lot of like cherry or dark blue or all these things that are like fireworks oh yeah it's like imagery to the admit a feeling i guess yeah so like instead of saying a night sky full of stars you could say (laughs) a star or a sky full of diamonds because diamonds create more of a visual lushness than just saying stars so then what shakespeare did was like every other word was like this lush full association so if you read it really slow i think you get more of a feeling than an actual story narrative apparently lana is gonna be releasing a spoken verb album (laughs) Well, I know she wrote a poem book. I yeah, read it though. She's, apparently, she's making an album though that's just spoken word. Really? That'll be interesting. I, mean, I'll I love Lana, it. but <laughs> what are we cool talking about? Like That'd be mix, great, right? It's a cool. It will be cool if it has like music mixed in with it too. I don't know. If she wants cool. to do just spoken word, 
I mean, she can do really whatever she wants to, you know. <laughs> At this point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Eliana says, I get annoyed because the music I like is technically most often pop, and most people mock me for it, but I mostly just listen to, like, somber slow music with great melodies as an ex-pianist. Yeah, I love melodies, too. I used to play, well, I, I do play piano still, but I'm not, like, I feel like I'm not up in it like I used to be, so I'd be, like, an ex-pianist, I guess, too. Because, yeah, I think, well, that's why I li I've been liking um, acoustic stuff lately. I don't know, it's seasonal, too. I feel like usually I listen to, listen to more somber stuff in winter and fall. But now that summer's coming up, I look for more, like, cool acoustic-y, Tash Sultana. I don't know if you know who, she's a, who she is, sorry. But she has some really cool sounding music, too. And it's just good, good vibe music. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara says, hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I couldn't join on those last live. I was really busy with my school meetings. You are oh, welcome, no Barbara. worries. But thank you for stopping for a little bit today, too. Like I said, I don't expect people to come to these every week. It's one of those things where if you want to draw with someone or if you want to just have conversation in the background while you're working... <laughs> Or maybe you just like to join in. And I don't, I don't know why, but uh, they'll be here for you. Also, I don't know if it's the weather. My allergies are extra bad today. <laughs> I feel like I can't breathe. Oh. Yeah. Did you get claritin. your claritin in? I did, yeah. But it takes like a week for that to really start working. Anra says, I feel like you're one of those people. Oh, this is so Tim. Anra, you got <laughs> Gotten to a tea. Cool. Like you're one of those people who watches film discussion video essays on YouTube while they draw. <laughs> I wa I follow so many film specific people. My favorite is this guy called YMS. It's it stands for Your Movie Sucks because I think when he first got into YouTube he was kind of bitter, and now though he is such a professional in the way he looks at movies is similar to the way I do it. If there is anything that you could watch from him that I think is such a good dissection of a film, it's his. The Genius of Synecdoche, New York. That's my favorite movie of all time. And it's his second favorite movie of all time. And he breaks it down. And the way that he talks about film and the way that the writer-director of that movie, Charlie Kaufman, discusses it is the same way I feel about not only film, but of art. And I love it. He's the guy that uh, wrote um, not only being John Malkovich, but what's the popular one? Oh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So it's very weird. It's very, it's, it's, it's been described as the most insightful and honest film ever made. And the ending of it is the most brutal truth you'll ever hear in your life. I'm going to say that right now. And I haven't made Josh watch it yet. We're like waiting for a good night because I need Josh to pay full attention because it is not a movie you can just. It's hard for me to do. Like. There are so many little details that I really like in movies, and I think Josh kind of knows I'm a person that likes little details that often get overlooked, especially callbacks that aren't that aren't very significant, <laughs> but they're fun for people like me that look for Easter eggs. So in this film, the first like five minutes, he wakes up, and it'll be September. By the time he wake gets down the stairs, it'll be the end of September, and then when he opens up his newspaper, it'll say October first. And then as he's going to get milk, they'll hear a thing on the radio for someone that died on October 14th. So time passes, and it's the whole point of that is to show the metaphor of how when we're older, time seems to just blend into itself, and days becomes weeks without us really changing the routine of our familiarity. And I find that like details like that are so phenomenal to me because otherwise you would just think it's someone walking downstairs, you know, opening a newspaper <coughs> and getting milk. If you're not listening to what's going on, you're not seeing little details on the newspaper, like on the milk carton, it even says like expires October 30 or October 28th. And then all of a sudden, as he sits back down, they'll talk about how it's Halloween on the radio. Oh. So this is a very weird movie about time, the passage of time, and then the lack of control we have with it. So I, I recommend it highly, but it's not easy to digest and it's not necessarily a happy film. So... Go in with, you know, your shield up maybe just a touch. <laughs> but anyways. I do want to watch the Nick D. Wait, eight, eight minutes, by the way, guys. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm not, I'm not on oh, top of this. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, Fidgety Fox says, I absolutely adored The Fall. My aunt showed me, oh, and it was amazing. A lower budget movie that I actually loved is called Ink. I've never heard of, I'll write that one down. I haven't heard of Ink. Oh, Asher would like to leave. I'm going to get the door for her. She's like, I can't take movie talk anymore. Right, she's like, I'm done. She's like, I'm <laughs> done. Oh, Goodbye, Astrid. Bye, Astrid. Yeah, Astrid does not like movies. No, she doesn't like anything, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. <laughs> Zahil says, I love her complaining about being on cam. Yeah, Astrid does not like the camera. No. Well, she used to. When it's on her time, she likes it. But if we force her to be on camera, she's not a fan. I feel like she's more comfortable than us in the basement. I don't know if... Yeah, I think this room gets... I don't know. Something about it she's not the biggest fan of. This room gets kind of toasty, though. Um... <laughs> Nick says, time management wasn't good for me today. I'm really behind. Oh, no. Oh, no. Vic says, my wrist got better and I'm almost done. Zadrick says rushing a bit. <laughs> Make it through, guys. That, oh, I, no. I feel you because that was me last week. I was rushing the fish. Thankfully, your wrist got better of it, too. I'm actually feeling pretty good about this one. I say, I feel like sometimes you go really big on these ones, so I think the size was better for you, too. Well, I think it's I'm going to actually stray away from realism. I'm going to add some contrast <coughs> where there isn't actually oh. contrast in the image, but Sorry, I'm going to have fun with it. I'm just... Okay. I don't know why I'm so stuffed up right now. Something's in the air. I feel like everyone's cutting grass too, and that gets me some hints. Oh, yeah. Um, Chris says, I'm getting a little stuck on the spire. This texture is odd for me. Uh, it's a lot of the pointed shapes. Just imagine, this one's kind of hard for me to say with like six minutes left. But you want the some of the points to be lighter, and then create the illusion of the form around it. So even if like you're doing a straight line, if you start bending that line, you know how you can make something look like it's more jutting out, but it's giving the illusion of you know like pushing out. And then when you're shading it, something like that. So it's tough because then you want to do that obviously everywhere. And then carry that shadow down. So it's a lot of this type of action repeated in a spire um, movement. So I, I hope you can you can get it in the last six minutes. Hmm. Um, Lena says, I feel weird, weird watching this since I'm not actually drawing the conch. I'm trying to just enjoy drawing characters after a little bit of time not really drawing. Oh yeah, I think there's a few other people here too that just, yeah. I don't know. I like, like I say, just like you don't have to draw what I'm drawing for these. <laughs> And I feel like sometimes we get in weird discussions, so it's always fun having people be here for that to join yeah. in. Five minutes left, by the way. Well, and I mean, I think just for my own personal amusement, I want to do some YouTube videos on just film recommendations because back in my early 20s, I would say I was a bit more snobby with movies, but now I've become way more um, accepting that, you know, everyone has different tastes. Everyone associates movies with uh, different times in their lives or you know i'm not gonna harp on a bad movie like i used to unless if like my friends are on we want to have like a fun <laughs> discussion about one but i think when it comes to movies i want to share film that i think broaden the variety of what we're used to and uh i always tell people that film is my my first inspiration for my art and my my biggest one alongside <laughs> like games and fashion and other artists but film really inspires me so I want to share some of the ones that I think are are great that a lot of people just don't know of, and I think they deserve uh, to be seen. And I, I want to make a YouTube or some video recommendations for that. So don't be surprised if in the next few months I do some more movie type um, YouTube <laughs> stuff. Oh, so me. I know that this area on the left side is actually not this light. But this is where I like to play with my own style and then push areas of contrast where I think would look kind of cool. So don't uh, do necessarily what I'm doing here because a lot of what I'm doing is breaking from the realism study and kind of adding my own little personal touch. Hmm. Um, 
Let me kind of catch up to you because I know we're going to be critiquing, so some of these we missed out on. Um, oh, yeah, knock them out. Right. Nathan Worm says, well, gold calls, comes from Orum, so that's probably where they, they use. And yeah, oh. it's based on Latin is what Felix is saying here. Uh, Vic says using chemistry is hard. Imagine learning it in a foreign language, Italian in my case. Oh, that's I could true. Not. Yeah. Fiji Fox uh, says schwa for weird history. Look up Corporal Wanchek. You'll thank me, I promise. If it's what I quickly Googled when I saw you write that, that looks really interesting. I think there's some YouTube videos on it too. So I might actually look at this. But it's a bear. <laughs> That's a it's bear. It's a more. brown bear bought as a young cub at a railway station in Iran by Polish Peace Corps. Or Polish Corps, sorry. Polish, Polish Corps sh corp soldiers who had been evacuated from the Soviet Union. This just looks like an interesting story. I'm actually going to give that a go. Thank you, Fidgety Fox. I was like having background history things to listen to while I. <laughs> do tax things or look up emails. <laughs> Lena says, Josh, I know the feeling I was better at essays, so having a Master of Arts in English Literature and Linguistics, no memorizing for test. Oh, that's awesome. Just a lot of essays. I know people hate essays, but I always liked those over um, multiple choice or filling in blanks. I always liked writing things out more. Sarah Bear says, I love biology and chemistry. I'm actually a physical therapist besides an illustrator, but I was so bad at physics and I needed to learn everything again when I went to uni. Oh no, that stuff's hard. There's just so much to remember. And I feel like it's a field that's always changing also. So it's like you learn, learn things, but then you have to learn more things. Um, Elena says, imagine learning the periodic table with none of the hyphens making sense <gasps> since they come from Latin English. While well, we had to learn the names in Finnish and then the hyphens made no sense. Yeah, that would be- a, I can't even yeah. imagine. I didn't like even learning it in English. All right, I'm gonna ring the bell because we have one minute left, everyone. Oh, one minute. Um, Ari Aster movies, Midsummer and Hereditary made me start looking up discussion videos like that. Those are good ones for that. Yeah, I think Midsummer creates. I mean, there's a lot of discuss. I I could do a whole thing about Midsummer, but I think there's a lot of uh, the fear of cultural being outside of what is culturally accepted and not understanding why it's accepted. I think that movie really dives into that fear. Unfortunately, I think it gets a little too much into gore porn which I'm not the biggest fan of, but I still really like that movie. I think it's a great movie. I would recommend it. But I wish they would touch more on the fear of cultural differences because that, I think, there's some real deep um, insight that can be made there, especially, I guess I don't want to spoil anything. But there is a death in that when it happens, everyone's like shocked, or at least the Americans are shocked, but to everyone else, it's very normal. So I think that would be a great thing to like, continue exploring oh yeah all okay. right we i know we're almost done time. we are at time okay do, do, do pencils have... down pens down <clears throat> as i add in just a little bit more okay so i actually feel pretty good about my conch today i i did it much smaller <clears throat> knowing that i didn't want the same problem with last week's with the fish so you can see i did a little bit more of uh artistic liberty with some of the shading on some areas but this was really fun, and I hope that you guys had yeah. fun working on this conch. So let's go ahead and do our critiques. So below, there's a link to the Discord. If you could join it and post your end result, you can either send me a picture or a JPEG if you're working digitally. And well, I guess all of them would be either JPEGs or PNGs. But post them in the Discord channel called Stream Follow Along. And then I'm going to switch to my Cintiq over here. And I'll do a quick mini review and look at your guys' stuff. And then we will call the stream over. Did you, you didn't write that note out, right? Because I'll just stick around for critiques then. Otherwise I can run another. Yes, office. yeah, you can go. What did you write, the note out or no? I have it written out, I have it written in the book. Oh, you know what, we'll wait then. Because I'll have to, I'll just ship it out tomorrow. Well, I'll, you can go, if you want to ship that, I can go then and ship the book myself. I'll just go after I'm done with these. Oh, no, you're good. Because, I mean, I feel bad that you don't have stay alarm for this. Well, I was just going to go because I was going to ship that book out, so we're good. Okay. Because all I'm the other open ones. Up Discord. Sorry, guys. All the Etsy orders right now. And we have a special order we have to get out. Okay. Oh, good. You guys are posting. Perfect. Move this over oh here. Oh, my gosh.
Okay. It's always so fun because I know there's a lot of people doing it, and you could tell they were like focused because they don't talk. And then they just post. Yeah, and then they come out of nowhere. I'm like, oh yeah, you guys were working. Move this over. Okay. All right. I'll scooch. Switch. Okay. I'll be right back really, really quick. So now for these, I'm going to smooth my camera over. Okay. Too much glare. So looking at your guys' examples, let's look at some of the warm-ups. Looking good. Now remember for warm-ups, definitely focus more on shape rather than details. Seems a lot of you did. Good job. Okay, hexadecimal. Ooh. So I like that you did a, a good focus on uh, differentiating between your smooth area on the inside of the conch versus the more rough textured. I would just even push you to even force more of that texture within the top of the spire. I really like some of the bumpy unevenness evenness of the surface on the left side. I think I want to see you carry that into the top of the spire because I think that's the one area that just looks a little more underdeveloped and I think it's just pushing more of the shadows in between the, the spikes. But I really like the bumpiness you got going on there. Been in a big art funk lately also if it's the fall. Yes, that's the, the one with Lee Pace. I, I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> Ooh, look at you, Luna Luz. I kind of panicked halfway through, but I pulled it through. Hmm, yes, this is gorgeous. In terms of a study, this is phenomenal. So good job. This is exactly the type of thing I'm looking for. It has a great sense of surface texture, of highlights. I can tell it has a glossiness to the actual surface of the shell. And I like that you didn't have too many highlights in the actual spire because the spire really doesn't have highlights compared to the shiny, smooth parts of the shell. I say every reflection, I feel like you got all the reflections even too. Yeah, there's some really good ones. I think my, my only, I feel like I'm nitpicking really, but I think it would just be continuing to show uh, some of the, the edge, like on the left side, see how it's a little more bumpy in the reference and on yours it's very smooth. And then same with the right side, there's a little more chips, but this is nitpicking, and honestly, I think you are focusing more on placement of highlights and value, so I'm not even going to nitpick. I'm going to say this is really well done. Good job, Luna Liz. Uh, potato, one of my favorite words. <laughs> Ooh. So this actually is a really good use of mid-value, mid-tone, and I, I can definitely feel some of the highlights. I think pushing it more, especially on the left side in the middle area here, I think my biggest critique for you is on edge control, because it seems like you're actually more comfortable with of values and doing some gradation between them than a really strong confident edge and I see some of the shakiness on the left side up here on the spire so I would just either go in with an eraser and try to create one simple line or uh, just clean it up so you don't have a lot of this uh, what my art my high school teacher would call chicken scratching and that way it'll have a more clean crisp edge to it so good job uh, lazo uh, I will admit, uh, opening this, the left side of the shell looks a little phallic, but I think uh, for you, proportions would be a big thing. It seems like you really extended the length of the spire, so I think shortening that. I do like how you're, you're playing with a lot of softness with your values, because then my next challenge for you would be push some of the edges and either go really dark, but I, you don't have to go super dark, I shouldn't say that, just like really crisp edges where it can really push some of the values can really make your uh, dimensional uh, aspect of your work really shine. So I would even just pull in uh, either a mechanical pencil or a pencil with a really sharp tip and just edge out some of where those shadows are really strong, especially under the flap of the inside of the conch and where it overlaps the spire to make it really dark and really push the contrast there. So yeah, I think I had a similar problem to you where I drew too soft. So my next challenge to you would be pushing a little bit of that hardness. From Pojanoita. Ooh, oh, this is this is lovely. I like the color that you used too. 
This is great. Honestly, looking back and forth, I think you did a really good job at selling values. You are very confident with working with light, mid-tone, and dark values, so kudos on that. I think my the thing that I'm noticing is some of the areas where you could have more smoothness or like an area of very little um, texture would be like on the inside of the shell here and a little bit on this side where there's a lot of lines going on. And even in the shiny part where this line is here, I would just smooth it out because I think it's okay. I think you're like me where everything has to have detail, everything has to have texture, but actually it's okay to have some areas of kind of negative space. And especially when the reference has a very smoothness to it, I would make it just as smooth in your execution as well. I think in terms of execution though, in general, this is very strong because you clearly have such a confidence working with value, so good job. So like that, I guess my challenge would be working with smooth areas. And then uh, you see how you have a lot of lines going vertical. I would almost work with the shape of the conch. So I would work maybe the lines going around the actual cone shape. And that will create more of the illusion of the form. So good job. Um, Zad, love this. Until I used a white gel pen for the highlight. I, no, I don't think you, it ruined with the, the gel yeah. pen. The only thing I will say, I can tell that you outlined the highlights before you added the gel pen. I would say if you are going to work with white, which a lot of artists do, and a lot of artists that I really admire, like Babs Webbs or Naomi, uh, they will just add the white on top of like a light gray. Well, if they're working with pencil. And you don't often, well, uh, this could be more of a stylistic choice, but I would say to really make your highlight pop, don't outline it first. I would just go in and confidently place where you want those whites, and that'll give you what you're looking for. In terms of the actual execution, I think this is pretty good. I think same thing that I just said uh, to the last artist is some of the lines down here, all of them go vertical, but I think having some go around the cone to show the form, I think would help out. And then I get a little lost here in this middle segment. I think pushing some of the darker values on here. I really like that you were confident with the dark values on the spire. And I think they got a little dark in here, but that could be a stylistic choice. So yeah, I think my challenge to you would be uh, continuing to play with highlights. And if you're gonna use this gel pen, try working, maybe even do like smaller studies of like spheres or something small, and then just place it right on the graphite. So yeah, good job. Wish I was a tree, says this really wasn't on my comfort zone. Hmm. Well, oh, you did a good job. If this isn't in your comfort zone, it doesn't read that way. So good job on this. I think looking at this, this looks like a real study of a conch that I would find in like an almanac or something where you would see references. And I think my, my critique for you would be uh, pushing dark skull a little darker and then having a bit more edge control. I think overall though, I wouldn't have been able to tell this is in your comfort zone. So I think good job. And yeah, it's just pushing some of the, maybe more of the mid tones just a bit. Uh, Felix, wow. Ooh. Yeah, these digital ones, I think because you guys are able to use the reference for color picking, it's really helping you guys create these very luminous uh, representations that are just very gorgeous, especially in the edge right here where it has some of the yellow and then it bleeds into this light, soft lavender color. Very beautiful. Even the use of colors is like spot on. That's crazy. Yes. I think some of the color, like this is a little too lavender where it's actually a little more pink, in, or at least the reference on my screen. But I'm not going to do nitpicking. I think for you, where you got lost is the left side. I think texture was probably a little bit more of a challenge, where clearly it seems that you're comfortable with softness and having that like soft gradation from one to the next. And then I like how you place the highlights on, but I would even make some of the highlights uh, a little more smooth looking. They look a little bit like a digital brush that was added in. And especially on the left side, I mean, this really feels like a, a scratchy, addition but I think when doing a study like this this is where you can slow down and take your time with adding texture and I think it got a little lost for me on the texture side but on the smooth side I think you did a great job 
So I think when you're, you're doing something like this again, I would lift up your tablet pencil a bit more, especially you can see the red lines of the reference, but on yours, they look like giant uh, strokes. And I think just kind of pushing a little more irregularity, a little bit more spot freckling on it would give it a better sense of texture. And then in, in terms of the spires, I think making it have more of the form could help. I think it gets a little lost, especially on the second row here. And I know in the reference it's a little rough, but I think pushing some of your edge control, like this could be a lot darker here, just to uh, insinuate the form going on. But good job overall though. And I, I like how you showed the brittleness of like the fracking or the cracking on the shell itself. So good job. Man, all these color ones, these are looking great. I should have done color. I, <laughs> I knew I should have, but I was like, no, I got to redeem myself from last week because this is such a gorgeous color study too. Uh, same thing with yours. I think color wise, this is great. I think unlike you can see on the right side, it feels a bit more blocked out, which isn't a bad thing. But compared to the last one where it had a very smooth, it felt like porcelain, yours doesn't have quite that smoothness to it. And that could be a stylistic choice. But I think blending some of the underlying color first could help because in your highlights, I can see how they're not fully a solid highlight. And not that the reference is like solid, but it's pretty well defined. Where on yours, it almost feels hesitant if if you know what I mean as I'm looking at yours. And even looking at the highlights on this side, they look a little hesitant. So I think maybe going in and cleaning up some of the edges on the highlights and um, especially with the smoothness on the right side of the shell, because I, I really feel the smoothness on the inside here, but I think this part doesn't feel as porcelain-esque to me. And I think having more of a bleed of a gradation from one to the next could help you out. But good job working with darker values too. Uh, Eunuch, okay, so very out of my comfort zone again. I didn't know what to do on the back of the shell and the part without the question mark was a huge problem as well. Ah! Mm -hmm. um, no, I think you guys are being way too harsh <laughs> on yourselves. This looks great. I think for you, it's something of uh, time management. I think maybe working smaller could have helped because honestly, I think this looks great. I think having more shading on the inside of this shell area here, this triangle, I think really giving it that form, that curve of the cone, I think you did a great job on this side. I think continuing to push some of the ridges up and down and then just having that continue throughout because you can see on the reference it has like a white edge and then it has like this tannish and then it kind of follows the rippling of the, the ridges. I think having that flow throughout, but honestly, I think this looks pretty great. I think it gets a little lost up here because there isn't much of a transition from the shadow to the edge. So it almost looks like this outer line was a mistake. But if you look at the reference, that's actually the real outer line. So I think somehow showing more of a transition from one to the next could help there. I think the spire looks pretty great. Maybe pushing a little bit more of the darkers uh, on this shadow area here. And then yeah, showing more of the texture. But overall, good job. Well, there were a lot of entries today. You're right, I think everyone was so quiet because they were so focused. Um, Anra, I shot myself in the foot by doing colors before really practicing values, but some of the tips on lighting were really useful. I think this is a great study. Ooh. It almost to me has like a, this has been sitting in like an algae pond water on the edge and it's like slowly infiltrating the edge of the cracking. And I like that that mossy green yellow is uh, in there. Yeah, I was gonna say, I love that green in the background like that. Yeah, and I think even the reds are very bold. To me, this shows that with color, you're willing to take risk and you're willing to be bold. So continue doing that, I think that's great. And I think that'll, that'll really benefit you in the long run as an artist. Uh, I think too many artists are a bit shy with color and I like that you're you're just like going for it. Uh, I think the spire could be a bit darker though. I think maybe this is a time issue. It almost looks like you started shading everything else and then the spire was like left behind. But when doing color traditionally in a study where it's 90 minutes and you start with a pencil, time can be an issue. Uh, but I think what you did create is pretty solid. Yeah, and I think maybe having some kind of a smoothness so I would work with a light tan or light pink, very light, or almost a white pencil. 
if you want to at the end smooth it out and kind of push in a little harder on the paper to create that more of a smooth look to it unless if you want to keep it more textured like this which is totally cool too uh, but I think using some lighter pinks especially on the right side would help out um, Chris the you got roached Ooh. another artist that feels pretty comfortable going dark so I appreciate that I think for you kind of similar to what I'm saying to a lot of artists I think having more lines that would go around the conch on the cone part could help create the illusion of the form a bit more and then really focusing on uh, smoothing the gradations instead of like letting me see where the pencil stops and I think it works a little bit where the texture is but on the smooth part of the shell I would continue having more of a, a fluidity to it and then leaving the paper texture to where the highlights are and then yeah I think on the spire I think I would have pushed a little darker and to show kind of the difference between where the spikes are and where the under parts are And yeah, I think overall though, this is pretty good. Uh, Larissa, ooh, okay. So I think for yours, I think immediately it reads as very mid-tone. I think I would push a lot of your darks to be darker and your lights to be a little lighter. And when I'm looking at the background, I think I would push it a little further out because right now it's almost like containing it in a way that feels constrained. I would like loosen it out and have it kind of fade it out if you want. So I like how you have the background showing the contrast, but then I would push it even further out because it's such a harsh edge to your outline. It kind of creates this double shape to your work. Uh, but the proportions look pretty great. Actually, they look pretty spot on for traditional. I think a lot of these points are too sharp on the conch I think softening them up just imagine it being you know berated with this water from the ocean and it's just smoothing out some of these harsher forms and then showing more of the texture so I, I'm not getting a lot of texture on this side of the shell and then on the smooth part I think really pushing the highlights so using the eraser and maybe pushing where the highlights would go on top of this like very light gray tone that you have going on and then especially the highlights on the tips here would really make it feel uh, more glossy. So yeah, good job, Larissa. Jamie Lynn, I think we have two left. Ooh, oh, very smooth. So I can already tell you like working in a very smooth uh, way, and I think maybe texture would be your uh, challenge. So I would, especially on the left side here, I'd really push some of those ridges and make it a bit more irregular. Because I, I can feel there's a tightness, even though it's smooth, it's like controlling it. And I think I would push the highlights a bit more too on where they are and have them really shine because I think they get kind of lost into the mid-tones. Proportions look okay. I think the spire is a bit taller and I think um, by doing that it makes this look much bigger than it actually is. And actually besides that looks good. I think this line here is also a little distracting. I think the shadow implies that there's a ridge there, but because it has more of a smooth uh, conus shape to it, I think this can be a little misleading. So I think I would get rid of that part. But overall, very good, Jamie Lynn. And Fidgety Fox, it definitely needs more shading for texture in the spire, but this was a lot of fun. Ooh, oh, actually, I really like this one. Oh, one just, another one popped in really quick. <laughs> uh, this is definitely something more that I would do. So I, I definitely can see that you're straying away from realism a bit and I tend to do that. So maybe that's why I'm like, oh, I love this. Uh, but I can tell that you have a, a very soft strength to your edge. You're very confident where you're gonna push contrast and it doesn't have to be black white contrast, it's like mid tone and light tone. And I like that you're pushing it right against each other and you're very confident with how you're doing it. Proportions look great. Uh, Spire looks oh, just a hair tall, but I think my challenge for you is even pushing the darkers just to be a little more dark and then on the texture side giving it a bit more unevenness because even though you're showing me a little bit of the wrinkle I think pushing it even more irregular to kind of show how broken up that highlight is and if you look at the reference it's really broken up where yours it feels very uh, uniform 
But the smooth side looks great because I think you're really good at smooth. I think pushing you to be more texture will be your challenge. But the way that you're handling the softness and actually going back to Larissa, this is what I mean by having a background where it kind of fades out. So it has that natural glow to it so that the subject matter becomes the focus, not so much the background edge. So yeah, really good job. Fidgy Fox, that looks fantastic. Brad says, went over a little, but I really wanted to have something to show this week. Mm. Woo, okay, so you're like me where I like to line art everything. I think when you do this, I would challenge you just to add some of the background and fade it out. Similar to the last one, you can see how then the whites look even whiter because of the contrast. So I think my first advice to you, try pushing some background value. And I would make your darker values even darker, especially on the spire. Uh, the proportions, spires is a little tall. I feel like all of you guys wanted to make your spires just a little taller than they actually are. And then I think the highlights, I'd really push more of a focus on. Uh, I really like some of the irregularity to the texture you have. I would just keep pushing that. And I think you guys will have a lot of fun with texture once you realize how much more character it can add to a subject matter just by adding more texture. But so besides that, good job. Hmm. Okay, those were all the ones we had for today. So thank you so much for joining. And like I said, I'll have this up on YouTube if, in case you want to uh, actually participate in it. But otherwise, look forward to the interview on Friday and we'll have another one of these follow along drawing challenges next Wednesday. Right. Any last words, Josh? Um, I love everyone. Thank you everyone for hanging out today. It was fun talking with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. All right, take care everyone and hopefully we'll see you later. I gotta find out where I put my OBS. There's still the poll for cloud going. <laughs> oh, I gotta change that. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, bye everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.